So, uh, it, we uh, are a research organization. We try to keep up on all the latest. And uh, of course, it is uh, sometimes practiced uh, in this age of technology here uh, when uh, confronted with a task uh, that is frequently performed and could possibly get a little monotonous uh, to try to use automation uh, to speed up that task. And so I'm experimenting uh, with automation in an introduction of Wes Jackson. Um, so I have uh, performed a web search uh, with, with a search engine that will remain nameless uh, for the phrase Wes Jackson is. Uh, and, and, and it generated uh, this introduction. <laughs> Wes Jackson is founder and president emeritus of the Land Institute, a nonprofit science based research organization working to develop an alternative to current destructive agricultural practices. Wes Jackson is one of the foremost figures in the international sustainable agriculture movement. Wes Jackson is a large man with the metabolism of a hummingbird. Uh, um, I'm, I'm, just re I'm just reading off the page. Uh, Wes, Wes Jackson is a contrarian with much creative inspiration to share. Wes Jackson is a plant geneticist and a leading voice for agrarian reform away from domesticated agriculture. Wes Jackson is writing with the huge disadvantage of a great title. Uh, Wes Jackson is a patient man. Wes Jackson is a visionary. Wes Jackson is always honest, professional, and fair. I wouldn't take my car anywhere else, not even the dealer. Um, well, the, the algorithm's a little shaky uh, still here at this point. Uh, Wes Jackson is fond of saying that if your life's work can be accomplished in your lifetime, you're not thinking big enough. <laughs> Wes Jackson is an extraordinary man, both in the quality of his insight and in his forthright assumption that radical problems call for radical solutions. Wes Jackson is uh, for nearly half of my life now my mentor. Wes Jackson is my colleague and friend. Wes Jackson is our next speaker. <laughs> It's about the way I wrote it. <laughs> you can't get good help anymore. <clears throat> I owe a huge debt, a huge debt, and uh, uh, to people that have helped me with this piece. Uh, Brian, my assistant and a good editor, um, my, uh, the head of our Ecosphere Studies effort, Aubrey, um, Bill V. Tech, uh, Bob Jensen, Stan Cox, and so on. I mean, this uh, paper, if it turns out to be a flop, it's not due to me. <laughs> if it turns out, well, forget all those other people. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, it's so good to see you folks again. So many familiar faces, and uh, oh boy. Well, we're going to have a lot of fun. July 16, 1945, 120 miles south of Ur Albuquerque, at the Alamogordo Air Base. Scientists and dignitaries wait in bunkers. At 5.30 a.m., an intense flash of light five miles away was followed by a sudden wave of heat and then a tremendous roar as the shock was passed and echoed in the valley. A ball of fire rapidly rose a mushroom cloud topped out at 40,000 feet. What were once the sands of Alamogordo had become glass over an area a mile in diameter. 
A month later, civilians living in Hiroshima and Nagasaki were incinerated. The civilian dead at Hiroshima numbered somewhere between 90,000 and 166,000. At Nagasaki, the estimate runs as high as 80,000 dead and another 60,000 severely injured. There are now 14,500 nuclear warheads worldwide. 6,800 in the U.S., 7,000 in Russia. The number in China is on the increase. Nine countries have them, and the increase of delivery systems continues everywhere. On the land, in the sea, in submarines, and in the air. The journey which led up to those three bombs being built and detonated did not begin with the Japanese Zeros bombing our fleet anchored in Pearl Harbor. Well then, what was the slab of space and time? Meaning, when and where did it all begin? The beginning of agriculture, some early energy war from the time of the first protocells on Earth. Who can say with confidence? But on that July morning in 1945, our Earth had only 310 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the air. Now, not 310, now 408 parts per million. When and where did that buildup begin? The Industrial Revolution, the beginning of agriculture. That 1945 world supported a population of around one-third of what we have today. These realities, nuclear threat, these realities, nuclear threat, climate change, population, are the big three. And these realities are increasingly tied together. So just hold on to that. I am going to leap to 40 years ago when we at the Land Institute began thinking about the problem of agriculture. Yes, we worried about soil degradation and erosion and such, but we also recognized that till agriculture was the fall, the fallen world. Indeed, the first expression of the even larger problem of excessive energy exploitation. The first big shift in our ability to go after energy-rich carbon. <coughs> in that case, the dense energy in grain crops and the mining and waste of the young pulverized coal of the soil. So given this fault line in human history, this foundational break with nature due to our intervention into the natural integrities of ecosystems in ways that disrupt the complex interactions, well, maybe. Natural systems agriculture can be our contribution to efforts to heal that split. More importantly, does the conceptual framework of looking to nature and to nature's ecosystems, which has informed our research, 
to address the problem of agriculture? Does it have what it will take to deal with nukes, global warming, and population? Now this won't surprise you. Life on this planet is the scramble to get energy-rich carbon. And we humans, with the big brain, got so good at getting and using that carbon that we started creating problems. We might understand this irony as a kind of elegant trap. Our success in carbon seeking that has allowed the expansion of our species has also created the conditions for our potential demise. Without realizing what we were setting ourselves up for, the invention of agriculture, the domestication of plants and animals that kicked the human carbon-grabbing enterprise into high gear, <clears throat> that enterprise <clears throat> put us on a trajectory that now makes a human future uncertain. Our cognitive capacities and collaborative social structures enhanced by language allowed us to get at that carbon in ways no other species could have imagined. And for a period of time, our cleverness has allowed us to transcend the limits that the ecosphere has long imposed on organisms, or more accurately, to appear to transcend since no organism can live outside the laws of physics and chemistry that organize the ecosphere. <coughs> That's the trap we walked into, and it's elegant in at least three ways. One, by the time we could understand the consequences of the pedal-to-metal pursuit of energy-rich carbon, there was no easy way out. It was if the designer of the trap was willing to rope in the target of the con for a long time before springing the trap, kind of like the movie The Sting, which has Robert Redford, and now we're feeling stung the wait until the sting. No easy way out. That's number one. Number two, once we were aware of the trap, we believed that doubling down on human cleverness would get us out. Our collective hubris led us to believe we were smart enough to invent our way to sustainability and we know how that's working out. Wind machines, solar collectors, more efficiency. That's human cleverness. And now number three. But the elegant trap, and here's an important point. It plays on the better angels of our nature, on our compassion. Because we feel the suffering of others, we struggle to find ways to feed our less fortunate brothers and sisters. Yes, we are often cruel, but we also care about others and instinct that we want to foster. <clears throat> and so, with those three in mind, the human story is always complicated. Some have avoided the trap. May they weren't tempted by its elegance, or perhaps the trap had not yet presented itself. But once the trap was sprung in the world, no one could escape the consequences. Humans began to travel the globe, and those who have been willing to do what's necessary to accumulate wealth and power have generally dominated. We wish it weren't so, but when history offers lessons, it doesn't promise they will be clean and neat. 
So is there any hope? What do we need to design an elegant escape? Well, the scientific method and the thoughtful deployment of technology produced from science is certainly part of the process, but we also need a new story. So where will this new story come from? Sure, it will draw on the wisdom of the ages, especially the wisdom of those people who were not pulled as deeply into the trap. But things are different today. And one of the differences is the extent of what we know about our origins. <coughs> As Brian Swimming and Mary Evelyn Tucker <clears throat> point out <clears throat> in the Journey to the Universe, a project, we had Mary Evelyn here a few years ago. The project involves a film, a book, a website, and uh, the importance of that I've spoken of often. Well, now we have a verifiable cosmology. Physics and chemistry have given us an account of the origins of the universe. <coughs> I'm going to need some water here in a little bit. Oh, thank you. <coughs> Physics and, and chemistry have given us an account of the origins of the universe and the origins of life on earth that is complete enough to give us some confidence in what we know. But humans are moved not only by fact, but by stories and symbols. Older cosmologies were expressed in art and music. Take a look at the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. Our granddaughter, Abby, Jackson, Nancy's daughter, Nancy's around here on our board. Our granddaughter, Abby, pondering a picture of the two fingers in the Sistine Chapel, uh, that, that of God and that of Adam not quite touching, Abby thought they should have tried harder. Abby will be, be pleased when I tell her that's the first laugh I got and probably <laughs> the last one. <clears throat> then there are the stories about Turtle Island. Humans in the past had less scientific knowledge, but great art. They had less scientific knowledge, great art, but now we have extensive scientific knowledge but not long enough to be expressed that expansively in art. I want to slow down right there. We just haven't had enough time for the artist to act on the verifiable cosmology of the journey work from the Big Bang to the stardust to the formation of the galaxies to the formation of planets to the journey from minerals to cells to the diversity coming from Darwinian selection. We, for the first time in our long journey with the big brain, we have a verifiable cosmology. Now, we need that expressed in art, and if we uh, last, we will get it. It'll come. So, we have the inspiration of knowing that our stardust elements, our, we know our elements, where they were shaped, the carbon, so, so importantly in our bodies, in the remote past of a dying star and from it lower temperatures, nitrogen and oxygen, these spewed out. This story waiting on us to come up with the new symbols, 
So we got the story. We're now waiting on the new symbols for this species whose behavior features symbol making. Look at the advertising world. We are symbol makers. We pay attention. All that is essential, that symbol making, but that's not enough. We are land animals, bilateral upright beings, successful products of the simian line, with a three pound brain, with more neural connections than we can ever hope to map. We need stories. But we also need an intellectual framework to guide our actions in the world. Art matters, so does analysis. So we have a new story. That doesn't mean we jettison all the old stories, just that we must interpret them with mature minds. actually whiskey. <laughs> it's going to get better, folks. <laughs> so the example that about the old stories, now you settle down. I mean, this is, you, you're allowed a little bit of this. Uh, um, the Garden of Eden served as a metaphor for the fall, which I think came with agriculture. Understanding that fault line as the fall, that's a very useful story. One people in this culture know and can be open to reinterpreting. So the third, so the story is told not with the old cosmology, but with our new one. So this shift in both understanding and practice will require significant effort. Okay. The Manhattan Project to build the bomb comes to mind. I plead with you to suspend judgment <clears throat> about what that project produced for a moment. <clears throat> The quest to build the bomb took those people in the new territory and threw together people from very different backgrounds to search for answers. We also should remember the scope and scale of the project. Perhaps it offers a model for what is possible when a society decides that a threat requires marshalling resources. What if we had 500,000 humans at work on the cap on carbon and rationing project? I said 500,000. That's what the Manhattan Project had. The Manhattan Project ran for three years, from 1942 to 45, through the two bombings. <coughs> that cost, this is Jack Daniels, <laughs> the cost in today's dollars, 30 billion, or 10 billion a year. Now imagine a global think tank supporting half a million people around the world with the same spirit of engagement proportional to the Manhattan Project. So how about 10 billion a year for three years and see what we come up with? And by the way, Brian worked this out. That's only 20,000 per person per year might need at least 10 times that amount. So <clears throat> nuclear weapons, climate, population. Now, as I see it, those represent a kind of a canopy. 
And all of what the rest of us are doing are really at work under that canopy, hoping to not only make our own little accomplishments, but have an effect to the eventual end of nuclear weapons, the eventual end of climate change, the eventual reduction of the human population to a level that can be run on contemporary sunlight. So there are organizations for projects with specific focus, such as the Land Institute's work, or the Barry Center, or the reinventing of the commons we heard from David this morning. And if, uh, so we need to think about ways to work, though, at three levels. One, the material reality of a definable project. I'm going to give you two examples of a material reality of a definable project. The development of markets and viable rural economy to make small farming possible again. To, uh, also, the development of perennial grains. Uh, throw that in for no extra charge. <clears throat> uh, that's a key part of a sustainable egg. Number two, the need for system change means going beyond capitalism and working for democratic politics that responds to ordinary people. Now, then number three, there's a cognitive challenge, which is to say recognizing that even if we wiggled out of an exploitative economy, there are still problems in the way people think about the world and energy that socialism and radical democracy will not fix. So we got those three. And work at any of these levels can make a contribution to the possibility of a decent human future. Work at all three levels is necessary. So we can say, let a hundred flowers bloom, from Mao, the policy of letting a hundred flowers bloom and a hundred schools of thought contend is designed to promote the flourishing of the arts and the process, progress of science. But whatever flower project one is pursuing, we should be thinking at all three levels. My point is, we already have more than a thousand flowers blooming, not just a hundred. They just need funded. Sterling College in Vermont, along with the Berry Center, has a program to educate and train young people to become farmers. Flagstaff College, just now being established in Arizona, has designed an authentic, for the last two years, junior, senior uh, of college, designed an authentic person-to-person -person educational relationship that is place-based and committed to face-to-face -face learning. It is issue-based. There are no course offerings around academic disciplines and specific types of employment precisely because real life does not stay within interdisciplinary boundaries. Ecology, economics, and justice are intertwined. So that's the sort of nonprofit world out there doing various things. Who knows what may come from recent studies on human behavior and human neurology? This is just one issue of Scientific American that carried several relevant insights for new ways of thinking. It seems, number one, it seems there are two features which created the human mind. Complex scenario building and exchanging thoughts with others. We have the ability to come up with complex scenarios, and we have the ability to exchange. So let's count this as a gift we possess that we can build on. Two, scientists seem to be at a loss 
define distinctive psychological, neurological, or genetic traits that could explain the uniqueness of human language. Language appears to arise from, get this, a platform of abilities, some of which are shared with other animals. <coughs> some researchers are exploring the origins of morality and how we learn to put our fate in one another's hands. That seems useful. Why shouldn't the project have people working and thinking on these things along with those folk at the Berry Center, University of Vermont, the Land Institute? So it becomes one purpose to put the cap on carbon and bring on the rationale, the necessity, and possibility for rationing. Stan Cox's book, Any Way You Slice It, The Past, Present, and Future of Rationing. And that's very broad in its rationing, uh, in its description. You can buy it in the bookstore, special today, uh, which is the same as always. Uh, <coughs> So, you know, we, uh, there's, there's some things that, that we can be working on that uh, go beyond the usual of what those involved in the so-called sustainable movement are about. Here's one. This is good news. A close look at the archaeological record has given us reason to believe war may not be in our nature. <laughs> so why do we fight? The person that was born at 9-11 will be eligible for the draft next year. 18 years we've been at this. Why do we fight? We say it's in our nature. Oh, what's the evidence? And what are the causes behind it? Here's a fourth one. A Duke University researcher believes that the seeds of human morality were planted some 400,000 years ago when individuals began to collaborate in hunting and gathering exploits. Such cooperative interaction cultivated respect and fairness for other group members. Our motives are not always selfish, the article says, and there are even a genetic factor behind us not being so. So another researcher has addressed the question why we fight may be the cultural conditions that arose very recently within the past 12,000 years. That's not long ago. So here is useful science, perhaps. Um, <laughs> a recent article uh, reminded me of George Orwell's 1984. Some of you here remember it. It was published in 1949, and it describes the totalitarian, totalitarian state <clears throat> in which the population never fully grasps the enormity of what was demanded of them, <clears throat> and they were not sufficiently interested in public events to notice what was happening. So by a lack of understanding, they remain sane. <laughs> so this we have to avoid. We got to run the risk of going insane <laughs> and not allow politicians to put us to sleep, especially when it comes to the 
international panel on climate change having to report to the different countries and them watering it down. So perhaps our job is to watch for the opening for a Manhattan project, one that will collectively bring intellectual and natural resources from all over. So the point is, we have to imagine ourselves withdrawing from the four billion year old dense carbon imperative. That's when life began and we're carbon based. Um, bacteria on a petri dish go after the sugar. Drosophila flies in a flask on yeast go after it. Capitalism is just petri dish economics. <laughs> if we believe it's impossible for us to give up on that, then we will arrive where we're currently headed. To counter this, to counter this, we will be accused of tilting at windmills. But so what? If this is not considered necessary, then what is? And so, do we need a Manhattan Project for Ecology and Energy? How about a new Manhattan Project that is headquartered, at least philosophically, in Kansas? A signal that the process starts out away from the cosmopolitan centers. Some will suggest that modern Kansas is not politically configured for such things. <clears throat> but we can look beyond the current political leadership and think about the possibilities of our activities kicking off a new commitment. So what would a Manhattan, Kansas project look like? <laughs> One, economists would get paid not to pretend that perpetual growth is possible, but to plan for the powering down. Two, anthropologists who help us sort out the different approaches that different peoples have used to fashion stable, decent human communities. So we got economists, we got anthropologists, artists who shape the new story. Such a project would not only not be solely for academics or professionals. Four, instead of rejecting the traditions that have been pushed aside, indigenous cultures, Amish, and so on, bring them in, ask for their help. Not to pretend we can reproduce the past, but to seek wisdom. And number five, a new Manhattan, Kansas project would not seek to maximize the exploitation of energy. It would use the ecosystem as the unit of analysis and hence focus on relationships. That native prairie features relationships. The individual's relationship to self, our relationship to each other, the human relationship to the larger living world, all the while being aware that our stars are our ancestors. Co could such a project help us plan on an elegant escape from the trap. Once again, we see irony. The features of the human animal that gave us such advantages of the scramble for that carbon, our cognitive capacities and collaborative social structures enhanced by language are our best hopes for getting out. 
Those human abilities led us into the trap. Eventually, those abilities also lived successfully as gatherers and hunters for millennia. And with those same genetic predispositions, the goal is not a naive attempt to return to the last, but rather to learn from it. Those abilities produce the high energy, high technology society that can no longer be sustained, but we can redirect those, re redirect those abilities to new ends. We learn, and one of the things we are capable of learning is the need for a change of course. The unthinking application of high energy, high technology solutions to agriculture has already failed. The failure of success has been evident for decades, but a more thoughtful use of science and technology in which careful deliberation checks hubris is possible. This is where daring to feature questions that go beyond the available answers will force knowledge out of its categories. That's where that is crucial. No one knows, but the exploration of answers requires geneticists to talk with anthropologists and poets to come into the laboratory. And as we expand our knowledge, we seek to temper our knowledge with wisdom. Now, as someone who's long advocated an ignorance-based worldview, and you folks know that we've been about that for some time. Wendell's the one that put me up to it um, <laughs> way back. Um, we recognize that for all we know, there remains far more than we don't know and much that we can never know. And I'm understandably hesitant to make definitive statements, but this I believe. I believe this. It all turns on affection. Many of you will recognize that from Wendell Berry's 2012 Jefferson Lecture for the National Endowment for the, uh, the Humanities, which Wendell borrowed from E.M. Forster's novel, Howard's End. <coughs> so a story about affection. A few years ago, I was on my way to either Lawrence or Kansas City. I decided, as I often do, to detour a few miles north to drive by and maybe stop by the farm where I grew up. I don't usually stop, but this time I stopped. And I walked over the black soil character of the Kansas River Valley. It was 40 acres, a small farm by today's standards, but at any one time had 20 to 25, 27 crops, all irrigated when necessary from a well, which yielded 500 gallons a minute. From the pump house, the main ditch had a few ceramic tiles some 30 inches in diameter, the main ditch connected to the fields by a series of branch ditches which, where we used our shovels to give the water advice, plugging here, opening there. And as I walked along on this particular late fall day, long after harvest, I perhaps thought of my grandfather's purchase of the farm in the 19th century and the former diversity of crops and livestock where I grew up. The barn is now gone, as is the windbreak for the hotbeds on which 50 or so turkeys would roost. The chickens, the geese, the hogs, the horses, the milk cows, all gone. The trees along the creek, the woods on adjacent property, all gone. And looking down at the black Call Valley soil, I spotted this, a shard. I immediately recognized it as a piece of one of the large broken irrigation tiles. Had it been an arrowhead, and we did find those now and then, 
I could not have been more moved. This shard has no value to anyone but me. But it hangs in my office as a favorite art piece. I love it. I suppose as a placemaker. The shard doesn't return my love. About the memory it conjured up, I can't say. But the shard and I have an asymmetrical relationship. Just so the earth may not seem to love us. At least on our terms. But it is, isn't it enough for us to love it in all the little places. It is considerably easier to care for the people and things we love than to care for what we are indifferent to. It all turns on affection. We have affection for each other and for our places and we now have to think about our relationship to the earth as a whole. As the old hymn, Oh Worship the King goes, the earth is our maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. Let's start with the first recognition. The earth is our maker. It is from what we call the non-living earth that life emerged. That's the journey from minerals to cells, and it supports us. And from Darwin and selection on, it's a part of the journey of the universe. That helps, us re helps reorient us. And if we don't want to speak of creation by a divine force, we can speak of the earth as our creator. Our grandparent, the dying star. The earth literally made us and it continues to defend us with an atmosphere that protects us. The upper atmosphere protects the lower biosphere and makes it safe. Whatever story we tell reminds us that the patterns of this world emerge from the earth, not from our heads. Let me repeat, we humans do not make the patterns of the world. Our maker, defender, and with proper attention, with proper restoration, Redeemer. So the restorative, regenerative work of renewal, but that requires us to first recognize that no one can be redeemed without, before acknowledging failure, before confronting our own sin, whether born in innocence, which I think a lot of it was, or born in evil. So is the earth our friend? Does the earth care about us? That depends on our understanding of friendship. Do we want the earth to be the psychopath friend who always tells us we're smart, good looking, and funny? <clears throat> that won't help much. We need the earth to be the kind of friend who tells us the hard truths about ourselves. And if we listen to the earth for that friendship, perhaps it'll be there. There's no guarantee, but in the Judeo-Christian tradition there is, according to a biblical promise, to expect a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. The astrophysicists have given us a description of the new heaven. We can participate not in the exploitation of the earth, but in the establishment of a new earth. Perhaps we should stop looking to the heavens and think of a new heaven and earth as a place here. In that story, there are the old anarchists, there's the old anarchist saying, which goes, no gods, no masters, except our ecosystem to whom we are accountable. <laughs> if we put away childish things, we can take seriously the words of June Jordan, who in her poem for South African women said, we're the ones we've been waiting for. 
the new Kansas Manhattan, Kansas, the new Manhattan Project, Kansas style, can start in each of the seats in this barn and beyond. Thank you.